Okay, last time we talked a little bit about uh, genes and behavior and the, the genetics of behavior. Now we're going to move on and talk about the evolution of behavior and the relationships between those two. Let's start with the definition of evolution. This is as good as any. It's changes in allele frequency in a population over time. There are potentially other definitions, but this is a nice broad definition that will uh, make it easy to work with. So remember that an allele is one version of a gene. When the versions of a gene, the frequency of those versions, change over the course of time in a population, multiple generations, then evolution has occurred. Uh, the bigger question is how? The primary mechanism driving evolution is called natural selection. Natural selection is the idea that Charles Darwin gave us in his uh, pioneering book, The Origin of Species. I'm going to lay out the basic premises here, and you'll see that it sort of has to happen in this way. First, I think everyone can uh, recognize that offspring resemble their parents because they inherit their genes. Even if you knew nothing about genes, uh, it would be clear that offspring resemble their parents. Uh, my daughter looks a little bit like me uh, and a little bit like her mom. She looks very little like a brook trout uh, or any other fish for that matter. Uh, because she didn't get her genes from a brook trout. She got them from, uh, from me and from her mother. Mutations and recombinations make new heritable variations of genes. Heritable just means that it can be passed down from one generation to the next. Mutations and recombinations are ways of changing genes. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about these later. Some individuals in a population, people, birds, fish, plants, what have you, some individuals within any population, any living population, successfully pass on more genes than others to the next generation. In other words, some individuals have more surviving, reproducing offspring. Any gene or set of genes that helps an individual pass their genes on to the next generation is going to be more common in the next generation. So, to the extent that genes can influence things that help you survive and reproduce, those genes will increase your likelihood of surviving and reproducing, and therefore the next generation will have more of those genes. Genes that don't do a good job or are less successful at helping an organism pass on its uh, genes to the next generation those genes will be less frequent in the next generation. So if you follow this through, you see that uh, really the process of evolution by natural selection is kind of a logical necessity. So how does this work? Again, this is called natural selection, but there are a couple of different mechanisms within that fall within natural selection. Uh, how is it that some organisms manage to pass their genes on at a higher rate than others? Ecological selection is one mechanism within natural selection that does this. And this is the one that most of us think of when we think of natural selection. Here's a classic example of natural selection at work. This is called the peppered moth. They're found in England, and you can see why they're called the peppered moth. They have uh, this sort of speckled black and white appearance. In 1848, 98% of the population looked like this. But about 2% of the population of peppered moths looked like this. They had a darker pigmentation pattern without the white speckling. You could think of it as sort of the difference between blue eyes and brown eyes. Uh, just one gene influences this. But you can see that this particular uh, pigmentation pattern is much more common in the population as of 1848. But by 1895, less than 50 years later, you can see that only 5% of the population had this light pigmentation pattern. And now 95% of the peppered moth population in England had this dark pattern. Some of you already know what happened. It was the Industrial Revolution. Between 1848 and 1895, factories were popping up all over England, spewing soot uh, from the coal and the wood that they were burning uh, to run these factories. That soot then settled on everything. They didn't have scrubbers in their smokestacks at the time. Uh, 
uh, to prevent that kind of particulate matter from coming out. And so it settled on everything. It settled on rocks, it settled on the light-colored birch trees, all the places where these peppered moths would have landed uh, and hung out were now much, much darker than they had been. And that made these light-colored moths easy prey for birds and other predators that would eat them. These, however, the darker colored ones, weren't such easy prey anymore. And as a result, the darker moths survived and reproduced at a much higher rate than these did. They had genes that allowed them to survive and reproduce at a higher rate, and therefore, over the course of several generations, their frequency, the frequency of the alleles that produce this dark pigmentation, became much higher. Evolution had occurred. Again, that's ecological selection. You can think of that as survival of the fittest. Uh, that's normally what we think of as natural selection. But there's another very important mechanism by which nature selects which genes get passed on or which individuals pass their genes on. And that's a mechanism called sexual selection. You'll probably know that this is a peacock showing its bright, colorful plumage. It's got these beautiful iridescent eye spots and beautiful iridescent neck and body. What survival advantage do you think that this plumage serves? The answer is, is that it doesn't. It doesn't help the animal survive at all. If anything, it's a, it's a liability. Uh, it would slow this animal down in escaping from a predator, and it might even attract more attention from predators, especially when the plumage is up in this state. If these big feathers produced an advantage for the male peacock, then it would also uh, produce an advantage for the females of the species, called peahens. But peahens don't have this plumage. Instead, they're pretty boring looking, and they have relatively small feathers, and they're just brown. So what is this doing then? How did evolution drive the production of these feathers? And the answer is really sexual selection. It's not about survival of the fittest. It's about access to the limited reproductive resources of the opposite sex. Darwin wrote in An Origin of Species that sexual selection depends not on the struggle for existence, but on the struggle between the individuals of one sex, generally the males, for the possession of the others. Just as an example of this, in a, uh, in a game preserve, they clipped off many of the eye spots of some of the peacocks. And they found that those peacocks lost their mojo. They did not reproduce at as high a rate that season. The next season, they reattached the eye spots to these poor, uh, lonely peacocks, and they got their mojo back. They were much more likely to find a mate that season. So clearly these eye spots are doing something to help them attract mates. Why is that? Why would the big bright plumage help attract mates? It probably started off as what's known as an honest signal in evolutionary uh, biology and evolutionary psychology. An honest signal is some sort of physical trait or behavioral trait that shows that the individual possessing that trait is genetically healthy is a high quality physical specimen. So it may have started out that female peacocks, peahens, were originally attracted to larger, brighter feathers because it was an indication of health. The bigger, brighter plumage suggests that, that the males that possessed them were eating well and were healthy. And those with sort of smaller, less brightly colored feathers may not have been quite as healthy. So it would make sense to, to mate with the ones with the bigger, brighter feathers. And it may be that their children were therefore healthier as a result of that. And so the preference for those bigger, brighter feathers was continued on from one generation to the next. But at some point, the, uh, the bigger, brighter plumage became kind of a, an arms race that spiraled out of control, such that now you have peacocks with these enormous sets of plumage. What's to stop them from getting even bigger? Well, at some point, the, uh, the size of the plumage becomes a detriment for the other mechanism of natural selection, which is uh, the survival of the fittest, the ecological selection. At some point, the, the feathers become a liability for survival that outweighs their benefits in attracting mates. So again, sexual selection, 
You can think of that not so much as survival of the fittest, but rather reproduction of the sexiest. But of course, what's sexy is going to vary dramatically from one species to the next. Even ecological selection, uh, we talk about it as survival of the fittest, but really, survival is just a means to the end of reproduction. If you have genes that allow you to survive really, really well, but prevent you from reproducing, those genes have reached a dead end in terms of evolution. They won't be passed on, and the next generation won't have them. And then the final mechanism by which some organisms manage to pass more genes on than others is called artificial selection. This is uh, us selecting who passes their genes on, who gets to survive and reproduce. We often call it breeding. And it's essentially reproduction of whatever we want, whatever traits we want in any given species. One example would be milk cows. So over the course of the centuries, we've been breeding together cows that produce the most milk with bulls born of cows that produced a lot of milk. And over time, produce cows now that produce almost twice as much milk as they did a hundred years ago. Here's another example. On the left here is a naturally occurring plant from southern Mexico called Teosinte, which is almost certainly the ancient ancestor of our modern day corn. Uh, this is what it looks like in its wild form, but we've domesticated it. Uh, really, the, the Native Americans uh, living in the region domesticated it somewhere between six and 10,000 years ago. They would have eaten it, and they would have kept seeds from the plants that produced the biggest kernels and the most kernels, and they would have planted those. And then the next season, they would have again kept seeds from plants that produced the biggest and the most kernels and planted those. And over time, they were able to dramatically increase the size and number of kernels and also to get rid of this tough outer covering, uh, which would make it difficult to chew. So and what you end up with is modern day corn. Here's another example. This is a dog. This is Mr. Winkle. Uh, you may have heard of Mr. Winkle. He was on an episode of the TV show Sex in the City uh, quite a while ago. To give you a, a point of comparison, this is a champagne glass next to him. So he's very, very tiny, and his tongue always kind of hangs out like this. Um, not sure exactly why. This is also a dog. This is an Irish wolfhound. This is the tallest breed of dog. You can see that its head comes up to this woman's chest. They're quite tall. If they stand on their hind legs, they can put their feet on your shoulders and kiss you on the top of the head. This is a dog. This is a dog. This is a dog. And these, for all practical purposes, are dogs. Um, Canis familiaris, the domesticated dog, and Canis lupus, the wild wolf, the northern gray wolf, are essentially the same species. They're genetically almost identical, and they can interbreed and produce offspring that are fertile. I don't know if a she-wolf would be interested in Mr. Winkle, uh, but they could produce a, a viable litter of pups. So how do you go from a wolf to Mr. Winkles, or to uh, a pug with its nose uh, smushed into its face like this? Uh, and the answer is selective breeding, artificial selection. At first, selection for wolves would have been for animals that were more tame, uh, animals that were less likely to bite your hand off and hiss and snarl at you. Uh, those animals might have lived around human settlements, and there may have been kind of a symbiotic relationship there, a win-win situation. The wolves providing kind of an early alert system and possibly some protection against predators and maybe uh, competing human settlements. And the dogs would have gotten scraps of the food that humans would cook or kill. Eventually, humans started breeding them not just for whether or not they were tame for their behavior, but also for looks, breeding them down smaller and smaller in size in the Middle Ages so that they could sit on your lap, breeding them for specific purposes. The Irish wolfhound was actually bred to hunt wolves in Ireland, and they successfully wiped them all out. There are no longer wild wolves in Ireland at all. So the next time you I think it's shocking that evolution could have provided the tremendous variety of life that we have on the planet right now. Just imagine that evolution had many billions of years to do this, 
whereas humans haven't been able to do this just in a couple of thousand years. And really, most of the modern breeds of dogs have only been around for a couple of hundred years at most. But why are we talking about evolution in the context of a psychology class? Here's why. Genes code for proteins, as you know, and proteins do everything in the body, including everything in the brain. They control the development of the brain and the nervous system. They influence the concentration and the distribution of neurotransmitters, and also the receptors for those neurotransmitters. They do just about everything. As a result of this, cognition, thought, behavior, perception, emotion, motivation, every aspect of your personality, etc. In other words, you. All these things are influenced by genes, and therefore can be acted on by evolution, which is changes in allele frequency over time. So evolution doesn't just act on physical features of the body, it can also act on psychological traits, behaviors, abilities, tendencies, and so forth. I'll give you a a really clear example. In 1942, a psychologist named Robert Tryon published a really remarkable study where he took a genetically diverse population of rats and he ran them through a maze and did this several times and he identified the slowest rats and identified the fastest rats to learn the maze. He called them maze bright and maze dull rats respectively. He bred together the maize bright males with the maize bright females, and then bred together the maize dull females with the maize dull males. He did this for 12 generations, with each generation becoming successively more bright or more dull in terms of their ability to run this maze. Now, whether or not that ability translated to intelligence in other domains is, is uh, kind of unlikely. Uh, but nonetheless, for 12 generations, the maize bright rats and their descendants got faster and faster at running this maze, and the maize dull rats got slower and slower. Uh, so clearly, selection for these psychological traits, these behavioral traits, can be accomplished. And if it can be accomplished by us, it can be accomplished by nature as well. An interesting question is why it is that after 12 generations, they stopped becoming more bright and more dull these two groups of, uh, of rats? And the answer is almost certainly that Tryon ran up against the limitations of the genetic variability within the population. Just as in nature, you can only select for what's there. After 12 generations or so, Tryon had selected the combination of genes that had produced the very fastest rats and the combination of genes that were in the existing initial population that produced the slowest rats. And after that, there were just no more genes to select for. In order to get these rats to become faster or slower, you would have to wait for new mutations or recombinations to produce new heritable variations that then you could select for. Here's another example. In the late 1950s, a Russian geneticist started a, uh, an experiment where he tried to domesticate foxes, essentially tried to breed tame foxes. And he took foxes from fox farms in the area. They were being bred for their fur. And he selected the ones that were most tame already, which is to say not very tame, but less likely to hiss and snarl at you as you got close by. He took the, uh, the ones that most successfully passed that test. And the next generation, again, took the foxes uh, that were least likely to hiss and snarl at you as you came past and bred those together. Each generation, he took the foxes that were most tame. And within about, uh, with about three or four years, their behavior had changed pretty markedly. And now, this, con this experiment is still continuing. Nowadays, almost all of their foxes will jump on your lap and lick your face, and they, they act just, just about like any dog you could imagine. Again, this is the power of selective breeding, artificial selection for behavioral traits. Now let's talk a little bit about what evolution is not, some myths or misconceptions about evolution. First off, 
it's not a product of changes due to use or disuse of a feature, uh, especially not within an organism's lifetime. A contemporary of Charles Darwin named Jean Lamarck believed that this was the case. He believed that an animal or a person tried really hard to do something. Let's say you lifted weights every day for your whole adult life, that your children would in turn be stronger because of that. And we now know that that's not true. Uh, you can't inherit features that you acquired during your lifetime. Evolution is not necessarily improvement, except insofar as it makes the species or the population better adapted to its environment. But of course, environments change, and what was helpful before may not be helpful after the environment changes. What increased your fitness in the past may not increase it in the future. By fitness here, I'm talking about evolutionary fitness, which has nothing to do really with uh, how much you can squat in the gym. Evolutionary or adaptive fitness is defined as uh, how successful an organism is in passing on its genes to the next generation, having surviving reproducing offspring. Evolution is also not something that benefits the individual, and it doesn't even necessarily benefit the species. It benefits the genes. In a way, we are simply machines that our genes have created in order to make copies of themselves. For example, you could imagine having a gene that would predispose you to sacrifice yourself to save your child. Now, this isn't something that would benefit you. It would, however, benefit your genes in that it would potentially increase the likelihood of those genes being passed into the next generation. You could also imagine a gene that predisposes you to kill other members of your species, called conspecifics, in order to help your child survive or help your children survive. This wouldn't necessarily be good for the species, you'd be killing off other members of that species, but again, it would be good for the genes. This is how the game of evolution is rigged. It has nothing to do with becoming more intelligent or uh, more complex necessarily. Uh, it simply has to do with nature, the environment, selecting for combinations of genes that do a good job at making copies of themselves.